How about now? There we go. Good morning. Thank you for your patience. I was just saying I had a bit of a printer traffic jam waiting for my sermon among other people's printing things. Uh, but thank you for coming to worship. It's great to see you here. If you don't know who I am, I'm Pastor Jessica. I am the associate pastor here at St. Matthew, and it is a joy to welcome you to worship on this Baptism of Our Lord Sunday. Uh, yesterday was Epiphany. Um, perhaps you celebrated. I have just a few announcements before we begin. The first is that all of our education type things uh, restart today in between worship services. So um, education for all ages. Uh, for adult faith formation, we are entering into what we might call a brief survey of the New Testament. We'll be doing that until uh, one or two weeks into Lent. Um, and that is not enough time to go super deep into the New Testament to take a deep dive, which is why we're calling it a bit of a survey. And so I'd really invite you to come and join us in between worship services in the fireside room. Pastor Jim is kicking it off today um, to learn a little bit more about the New Testament. Um, we're gonna start by talking about its context um, and its, its setup, right? The canon and um, the order, um, a little bit of that history. Uh, so I would really invite you, um, if you are not um, being a part of other education events, to join us in the fireside room for that. We are um, entering into Faith in Action collection time. So Faith in Action is the service event that we do as a part of our worship service on Transfiguration Sunday, which is February 11th this year. And um, this year we are gathering supplies for uh, personal care kits for Lutheran World Relief. Um, this is definitely not the first time that we've gathered things for Lutheran World Relief, and in fact, we have a group here at St. Matthew that regularly gathers things as well as um, sends those quilts um, that we celebrate every year. Um, and we are um, going to split up the, the donations by item uh, for each Sunday. Beginning next Sunday, I believe we're starting with nail clippers. Donna is giving me the 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 um, nod. Yes, so we are. Um, you are invited next Sunday to bring nail clippers for those personal care kits, and you'll find places to drop them in the narthex. Um, just so you know, it you can bring nail clippers another time up until the 11th, but we are categorizing them by that. So each Sunday, you'll be invited to bring um, a different item for those care kits. Lutheran World Relief sends these care kits all over the world. Um, um, to uh, many different types of people in need. Um, we gave a donation, um, an open plate offering to Lutheran World Relief following um, the um, attack by Hamas um, a few months ago. Um, and so that is one of the places where they're active right now, uh, but they're active all around the world. So those personal care kits will go towards um, many uh, people in, in dire need of just basic care items. So. Uh, please consider bringing nail clippers next week and then other things the following weeks. Our men's retreat is quickly approaching. And one of the things about men's retreat is you do indeed need to sign up um, in order to come. And we really would love for you to, to go and be there um, and, and um, celebrate God together among other men at St. Matthew, um, for those of you who are men. Um, there is a sign up on the website for that. Um, and if you are someone who signed up in um, the, the portal to pay on the giving page wasn't yet active that is now active too but please do sign up for that that is at Kennedy School correct yeah, uh, McMinniman's Kennedy School. Um, great time to gather. So uh, please sign up for that. That is on the 10th of February, so um, a little over a month away. So get signed up while you can. Another thing that we would love to invite you to, um, if you are someone who's newer to our community or someone who has been a part of our community for a while, but you never officially became a part of our community in an official capacity, though you are uh, by definition, 
or by design, but not by definition, is our community introduction event. So we gather for a dinner um, and to answer questions about St. Matthew, to um, introduce um, new or new-ish folks to uh, the community of St. Matthew. And then the following Sunday, um, if you decide, you are um, welcomed into membership at St. Matthew. So that event is January 21st, so two Sundays from now at 4 p.m. Um, if you would like to attend that, uh, please let someone in the office know. Any of the staff can, can get you directed to the right place. Um, if you received an email from Vicki um, in the office, you can respond directly to her if she invites invited you to that, uh, but community introduction, um, dinner, and event the 21st at 4 p.m. That's all I have for you. And so I would love to invite you to stand as you're comfortably able. We are going to prepare our hearts and minds to enter into worship using our confession and forgiveness. And we gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll invite you to kneel as you are comfortably able. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. As a member of the Church of Christ and by God's authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand with me as you're comfortably able. We'll join together in our opening hymn. Of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. We pray together the prayer of the day. Righteous God, God, you you sent sent your son Jesus Jesus to be be baptized baptized by John in the Jordan Jordan, so so that that all might hear the proclamation of your love. Make us voices of proclamation so that all might know of your love through our words and our actions. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ our Our Savior and Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And I would love to invite all of the children up here to join me, please. Good morning. Hello. Did everyone have some good holidays? Were you excited to go back to school? Some yes, some kind of. It's a more positive response than I was expecting, to be honest. So I think we've talked about this in the children's message before, uh, but do you guys know what it means to repent? No. To repent basically means to say sorry to God and to to really actually mean it. Does that make sense? Have you had to say sorry to anyone recently? Yeah? Did you mean it? Yeah? Yeah? That's good. That's good. Um, Today I'm going to talk about a different way of thinking about this word, repent, which is kind of a big word, um, but maybe also another way of looking at saying sorry. So I actually want to invite you to stand with me. Can you do that? And let's, let's spin around three times, whatever direction you want to spin. One, two, I think you're faster than me. Three, all right. So is anyone... Um, kind of seeing things move around their vision a little bit. 
something's kind of swaying, yeah. What, uh, what do you look at when your vision starts to, to do that? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes if I spin for a really long time and I stop, it's kind of so dizzy that I feel like my body going to spin. Uh, yeah, sometimes it even makes your body keep spinning, yeah. Yeah, Maya. Sometimes you close your eyes, yeah, when you're getting dizzy. Well, let's look at this space. When you walk uh, into this room, uh, why don't you all face over here with me? Is this the natural place for you to focus on? No? no? Okay, well, turn a few steps to your left. Is this the natural space for you to look on when you enter into the sanctuary? No? Okay, let's turn towards Pastor Jim. Is this the, the way that we look when we... No? Okay, let's turn this way. Does this look right? Yeah. Yeah? This is what we, what we center on? Why do we center on, on this part of the sanctuary? Yeah? That's where the pastor is. That's where the pastor is. Um, close. Yeah? Um, it's where, like, um, the body and the knees are in the cross. Yeah. Yeah, that's very good. That's where the body and blood of Jesus are. It's where the cross is. It is also where the pastors are. And our hope is that we are pointing you towards Jesus. But yeah, this space, it's called the sanctuary, the place that we worship, it's oriented, right? It's made so that we will all look at this direction. So even if you walk in these doors and you spin around three times, the hope is that you would turn and face Jesus, the cross, the body and blood. And that is exactly what repenting should be about or saying, I'm sorry. Even if we got things mess messed up, mixed up, wow, mixed up, there we go, thank you, uh, because we've been spinning around. Jesus is always there for us to turn back towards. So when we say, I'm sorry, we're being invited in the midst of maybe our dizziness to turn back towards Jesus. In this room, it's easy because it's orienting us towards that, right? But sometimes we have to find another way to face towards Jesus and we can do that by saying, I'm sorry and kind of <coughs> redirecting our hearts. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Okay, let's pray. I'm gonna kneel, but you can stay standing. God, we thank you so much for this place, this room, this sanctuary, that it helps us point ourselves towards you. And we pray that in our lives, as we get things mixed up, as we get dizzy, that you would keep orienting us, keep guiding us towards you in physical ways and in spiritual ways. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seat. A reading from Psalm 2. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Here ends the reading. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! 
Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper to us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and Jesus the Christ in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It actually um, has been a while, at least for me, uh, since I was here in the sanctuary leading worship with you. Um, I was, of course, a part of the four, wor- four of the worship services on Christmas Eve, but unfortunately on Christmas Day, I was given the gift of a cold um, or some sort of virus. Um, and I was down for the count, unable to come on Christmas morning or worship on the 31st. And I spent most of my week on the count 
couch uh, reading books that I got for Christmas, which is pretty nice, uh, watching movies. Um, however, if I'm being honest, other than dealing with cold symptoms, that week was not unlike most of my weeks in my life between Christmas and New Year's. Um, the last week of the year is not usually a particularly busy or productive week for me. Does anyone resonate with that? Yeah. Um, that week at some points uh, feels like a pit in time, a void between two major celebrations here in our country. Um, and perhaps for some, there's even a bit of a come down from the Christmas joy and celebration. Um, that time between Christmas and New Year's sometimes feels like a month long. Um, and surprise, liturgically speaking, um, it's actually about three decades. Here's what I mean. Today, we celebrate and read about the baptism of our Lord, and baptism for Jesus, and in those times, was not infant baptism. Jesus would have been right around 30 at the time of this passage that we read for today. And you might recall that last week, we read about the Magi coming to see the baby, the child, Jesus. Um, guided by their bright star after the angel of the Lord had visited them. So uh, we have gone from Jesus the baby child to Jesus the man in about a week. Um, the rest of chapter 2 um, details Joseph and Mary fleeing with Jesus uh, to Egypt to hide from the murderous wrath of Herod. Um, and in those verses, we learn that Herod dies, and so Joseph takes his family to Galilee to settle in Nazareth, and that's how we get Jesus of Nazareth. And then, of course, we get to chapter 3, and we get adult Jesus, but no bridge or stories in between there about Jesus' childhood or family life. And this chapter opens with John the Baptizer, a wild man quoting scriptures as we now know as the Old Testament, sharing words of warning and urging listeners to repent. Now, for the ancient reader, the original audience of this text, the, the image of John the Baptist would have been a very familiar figure, not because they knew of John the Baptist, though they might have, um, seems like he had quite a reputation, but rather because of his stark resemblance and uh, in his behavior and in his words and lifestyle to the Old Testament prophets. I mean, he is literally um, quoting the Old Testament prophets, so there's certainly some familiarity there. But he especially bears resemblance to Elijah. The prophet Elijah was also known and understood as a wild man. And in the very last two verses of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi, it says this. <laughs> See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. And in this chapter, you might recall, hopefully, that John the baptizer is calling all those who are listening to repent which theologians love to point out, um, repent in scriptures like this means to turn, to make a 180. And that's not wrong. I mean, I used it in, in my message with the children this morning, but to assist in our understanding of what this Greek word that we translate to repent means, I want to share with you our, our Greek concordance definitions. Um, metineo is the, is the Greek word, and it means to change one's mind or to change the inner human or even to think differently after. So there's a turn there for sure, but a turn of the mind or a turn of the heart. 
And as we know, John the Baptist was calling people to prepare the way of the Lord. And while there may be some literal meanings there physically, calling people to create space is about their inner world more than their outer world in the midst of this prophecy here. And Jesus himself affirms later in the Gospel of Matthew, John the Baptist's identity and prophecy in chapter 11, where he says, truly I tell you, this is Jesus speaking, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and violent people take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came. Here's the point I want you to hear. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. And listen, they did, even before Jesus told them to. John was so compelling and his message so unique that even the most influential and powerful in the community, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, found themselves seeking to reap some of the benefits that they felt like John was talking about and bringing to the community. And when John sees that people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming to listen to him, he responds with what some might call a scalding confrontation. He does, in fact, call these Pharisees and Sadducees who have come to visit him, the influential, the powerful, a brood of vipers, which is quite literally a pit of snakes, a symbol at the time synonymous with malice or bad intent or even evil, but I don't know that you needed me to explain that to you, given what picturing a pit of snakes is like. So certainly, John the baptizer was likely very intimidating. Uh, and the words that he quotes are, are quite um, intimidating and scary as well. Um, and even the things that he says that are not quotes are, are quite scalding. He's quite brusque. And along those lines, we see John the Baptist's message as a big warning sign, a big red warning sign, not only to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but also to those of us reading the message thousands of years later. But if you actually read what is here in the gospel, John's instructions or demands, if you want to stick with that more forceful language, his demands are quite reasonable, all things considered. Though he calls the powerful who come to him a pit of snakes, what he is instructing them to do is really to recognize what drew them to him and then let it change them. These powerful people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were compelled enough by John's message or influence to come and hear what he had to say. And John really tells them to let that message keep influencing them, to lead them to repent, which, recall, means to think differently. And for these people, this change, according to John, meant that they needed to stop resting on their laurels, so to speak. In particular, the laurels that they didn't even really earn by being born into the faith, these Pharisees and Sadducees. John says that resting on your identity as a person of faith is not actually what faith looks like. To rely on identity and not actually allow oneself to be influenced and changed by the God in whom you have faith. And while this can again sound harsh or scathing, what if we heard these words from John the Baptist to these powerful people 
and all the others gathered and all the others hearing and all the others reading, what if we heard them as a promise rather than a warning? What if the call to repent was actually an invitation to a change of heart? While John's delivery may have been brusque, he isn't just calling people broods of vipers and then walking away. He's providing actionable instruction for their lives moving forward. What John is sharing is actually good news, that the kingdom of heaven has come near. People are not being invited into repenting or changing minds and hearts simply for the sake of doing so. There's an invitation to turn here because there is something to turn towards. And in fact, this chapter ends with precisely the thing to turn towards. Jesus coming into the world is ushering a new order of things, of good news, of God among us, of the kingdom being brought to fruition here in this place, in this creation. As Lutherans, we understand ourselves as being simultaneously sinners and saints. And our sin is our bondage to things other than God, to the idols of the world that pull our attention away from God, the things that keep us from turning towards God. If we are caught on these things, these distractions, Jesus coming to us can and should guide us towards rejecting the idols of our lives and turning towards the good news incarnate among us. There is something to run towards. That is God's work. That is God's initiative making that happen. The kingdom of God coming near in the person of Jesus. And so, in the very final lines of this chapter, we read about Jesus' baptism. And John, understandably so, doesn't quite get why Jesus would need to be baptized. Why is the thing that he has been inviting people towards by being baptized, inviting them to prepare for by being baptized, why does that thing need preparation itself? But Jesus, as he says, intends to fulfill scriptures in this act by identifying with the sinners who are coming to John. Not a sinner himself, but in solidarity with humanity for whom he is bringing change, for whom the kingdom is coming near. And in John's baptism, all who are gathered and all who will hear and all who will read see that the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus in the midst of this act of baptism. The Holy Trinity works together in this moment to mark Jesus' identity as God's beloved Son, as the Word. So in this moment of baptism, Jesus is simultaneously identified as Son of God and God with us, and as identifying with those around him who too have been or who will be baptized. John the baptizer's message doesn't end with judgment and fire, no matter how scathing his words might have sounded. John the Baptist's message ends with the beloved son and the kingdom coming near. The one and the reality who make repentance even possible, who give us something to turn towards. 
Jesus enters the story and shows us what righteousness really looks like, what the people are called to turn towards in their repentance, what we are being called to turn towards in our repentance. And what you are being called to turn towards, what we are all being called to turn towards, is that you are claimed by God. You are a child of God. In our baptisms and in our repentance, in recognizing this, we do not stay where we are. Being children of God and knowing that changes who we are, gives us exactly what we are supposed to turn towards. Just as Jesus' identity as child of God was announced in his baptism, so too are those who are baptized after him marked in their new identity as children of God and in that invited to move as beloved children into a way of life that is informed by that wonderful fact. It is January, as you probably know. We have just entered into the new year and many of you have likely set some New Year's resolutions or goals or intentions. I myself tend to set intentions every year. And while it definitely doesn't have to be uh, at the new year, it feels like a good time for me. I enjoy doing it by following the calendar year. But here is my thought for you to ponder. As we enter a new calendar year, as we sit with the promise that we are children of God and that God, God's self, identifies with us who came to earth as fully human and fully divine, God with us. In your baptismal identity as a child of God, what are you being called towards? What about Jesus' identity, his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, the kingdom that he will one day bring to full fruition on this earth? What is it inviting you towards? What do you think God would like you to turn towards? I think in a time of setting resolutions, intentions, what have you, it's really easy to get caught up on getting rid of things or changing things about ourselves or following what our social circles or other influences in our life might have us do in the new year. But what if we saw our resolutions as a turning towards rather than a change? As you turn to face God in the new year, what is God beckoning you towards? Amen. I'll invite you to stand as you're comfortably able. We'll join together uh, in response to hearing God's word in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. I'll invite you to share the peace with one another.
You may be seated as we receive this morning's offering. you stand with me? Pastor Jessica made the invitation for us uh, in this month of January to um, consider the task of turning towards something. And, um, and she, um, she pointed out to the kids, this, uh, this whole sanctuary is oriented for that purpose, to turn towards something, to turn towards the cross, towards the altar, towards this meal. We gather around it today again as an invitation to turn toward. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray together the words that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The bread is broken and the wine is poured, the gifts of God for the people of God. It is Christ who sets the table. It is Christ who is our host. It is Christ who invites you to come and share in these gifts of life. All who wish to find Christ in this meal are welcome and invited. You may be seated. If you're joining us at home, uh, I invite you to uh, serve one another. If you're with others, if you're by yourself, hear these words. The body of Christ given for you. Take and eat and the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink.
Will you stand with me? body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Let's pray as we close our service. Lord, we gather in this space and um, orient our lives towards you, turning back again and again, week by week, day by day, um, reaffirming um, the baptism um, that uh, called us into belonging we, um, we gather in this space knowing that there are words spoken here to change us, to renew us, to redeem us. Are we, um, we give our hearts the best courage that we can muster to those words and their place in our lives, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for, um, for a new year with uh, many uncertainties uh, still in it. We um, pray for the places of uncertainty and darkness, uh, for, of warfare, and, um, and, and we ask that your spirit would come in, that you would heal, that you would speak words that change lives. Lord, we pray that you would make us a part of that good work. Even um, as challenging as it seems to us beyond our ability, Lord, we pray that you would make us instruments of light in the world that you have set us in, that you have called us to, to be stewards, to be shepherds, to be brothers or sisters, siblings of Christ. Lord, renew our world through us and all around us. And Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift to you um, all the, the uh, impulses um, to, uh, to change and renew in our own lives. We think of uh, all the relationships that are so blessed and meaningful to us. Uh, some of them uh, needing healing and renewal um, and, um, and reappropriation. Lord, we, uh, we pray for all of those that are on our hearts today. Speak light and hope and send your spirit to them, Lord, through our prayers. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Go in peace, serve the Lord.